Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. What does a man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already. Long ago, it was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. So Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Lots of you could probably say this with your eyes shut. It's pretty cool. Rules for holy living. Since then... You have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, Whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues... Clothe yourself in love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Thanks, Deb. Uh, It'd be great to keep that second reading from Colossians chapter 3 open. We're going to turn to it in the latter half of our sermon. Uh, If you were here on time tonight, you would have heard from Graham that we're starting a new series, uh, a new sermon series looking at a bunch of different topics. Uh, Now, a few weeks ago, uh, I did something that I don't normally do in ministry. It's something that I uh, do from time to time, but isn't normal part of my job. I ran a funeral. Uh, A funeral for a a very elderly member of our church. Uh, He died at the age of 99, around about the same day that uh, Prince Philip died at 99, and we held his funeral. And I don't know if you go to many funerals much, but funerals have a way of getting to you, getting under your skin a little bit. I went home from that funeral thinking, I'm going to have to do this for my own parents one day, aren't I? As I sat there watching Uh, The daughters and the son give eulogies in remembrance of their dad's life. I thought, yeah, I'm going to have to do this for my parents one day. And then the thought struck me that my kids are going to have to do this for me one day. It'll be me lying in the box at the front of the church. And my kids will be remembering me. Uh, Funerals have a way of reminding us of what's real, what's true. We don't live forever. 
And there's a lot more to life than us. It's not often that we stop and think about some of the really big questions in life, is it? Not often that we question the values and the aspirations that we and so many around us accept as normal and good and true. It's not often especially that we stop and think about our very existence and whether there's more to life than us. This time we're going to be looking at a bunch of different topics uh, that touch on these things of life. Uh, We're going to think about some of the aspirations of our time, uh, some of the big values that our society and our culture have, things that we all long for, But like the teacher in Ecclesiastes says, we long for it, but we never quite find it. The eye wants to be full of seeing, but it's never full. The ear wants to hear everything, but it's never full of sound. We're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. That'll be fun. We're going to think about justice, hope, love, beauty, joy, immortality, community. And tonight we're thinking about authenticity. In each sermon, what we're going to do, little roadmaps for you, we're going to explore what that longing is, what it looks like in our world today, what it might look like in your life and mine. We're going to think about how we experience disappointment and frustration in all of these different areas, what Ecclesiastes describes as life under the sun, life without reference to God. We're going to see how Jesus and his gospel brings good news to these areas of life. Jesus helps us to see these longings in a new light in the way that God has made us to experience them. And each sermon is going to land in thinking about how each longing is fulfilled in the resurrection, in heaven, in the age to come. And today we're thinking about authenticity. I'm sure you've all heard some of these phrases. I'm going to read to you a few phrases. Uh, Maybe you've even used them yourself, or maybe your reaction is less than positive to them. Uh, Here's some phrases. You do you. Be true to yourself. Get in touch with your feelings. Follow your heart. How do you feel about those phrases? Do you like them? Are they your kind of guiding principles in life? Or do you cringe? Because that's like Disney princesses. Yeah. You might have used some of the phrases ironically and sarcastically. When a friend is making a dumb decision and you just don't have the heart to argue with them, And so what do you do? You roll your eyes and go, whatever, you do you. Have your pineapple and pizza or whatever. (laughs) Or you might use them to encourage a friend. When they're going through a hard time, you say to them, you just need to get in touch with your feelings. Follow your heart. Or you can use them when you want to be a bit selfish. This is just who I am, okay? I'm being true to myself. Or maybe you hate them because you've been a victim to them. You've been rejected or left behind because someone has broken their promises to you so that they can be true to themselves. They're all phrases about authenticity, being true to you, being an authentic person. And as I've said, you might love the idea of authenticity, being an honest, not quite honest, we'll explore that. You might love the idea of authenticity, or you might feel really cynical about it. And we're going to try and chart a way through the middle tonight and think about what Jesus says. Now, These kinds of phrases about being true to yourself are the basic storyline of every Disney princess movie, right? Uh, You know, here's the girl and she's frustrated by all of the expectations that people place on her, especially her parents. And so she runs away. She goes on a journey of self-discovery. She gains new self-knowledge and insight into her inner self. She gains confidence to be true to herself. And she emerges amazing, beautiful, wonderful, powerful better off when she's true to herself. That's what our world means when it talks about authenticity. You might hear authenticity and think consistency or integrity or honesty, but that's not what our world means. When our world talks about authenticity, it means the opposite of conformity. Don't conform to what other people want of you. Be true to yourself. This view of authenticity is built on a a philosophical idea called expressive individualism. It's the idea that in each one of us, inside each one of us, is a unique identity. Deep inside you is a set of feelings and thoughts and intuitions, and that's the real you. And so the goal of expressive individualism is to get in touch with that inner self and then perform that true self in the world. And so to be authentic, 
You've got to stop worrying about what people think of you and listen to yourself. You've got to switch off external voices and influences that want you to conform. You've got to turn off the voices of your parents and your friends and what they say you should be. And you especially need to turn off the voices of institutions and organizations and religions that want you to conform because they're not just old, they're oppressive. They want to harm you. They want to control you. And when you can switch off all of those voices, then you can just listen to your heart and be true to yourself. Let's think about a Disney princess example. I reckon there is no more epic Disney princess than Elsa. She is seriously powerful. Uh, All through her early life, she is oppressed by an evil external voice pushing her into conformity. And who's that voice? It's her dad. When the parents discover that she's got serious power to control ice, they make her wear gloves. And what do they teach her? Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. (laughs) Don't feel. Don't let them know. They've got to hide it. Elsa's been taught from early on in life that her true self is dangerous. And you've got to edit yourself. You've got to put on the gloves. Don't let anyone know that you're the ice princess who can seriously hurt people. And so Elsa, well, she's frustrated. She doesn't get to live an authentic life. She's oppressed, stifled, cooped up in a bedroom, hiding away from the world. And so what does she do? She runs away and goes on her journey of self-discovery. And as she's out in the wilderness, out in the snow, building her ice palace, Uh, She sings these words. I'm not going to sing them for you because I can't. Uh, It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small and the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Is anyone going to pick up the tune for me? Maybe Rose? (laughs) And what's her... Uh, her guiding principle now, here I stand and here I stay. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. That's the message of authenticity. Don't worry about anyone else. Just listen to yourself. Free yourself. Because the highest good in life is your own personal freedom and your ability to choose who you want to be. If you want to be authentic, you need to realize that you are the king or queen of your own life and you live by the rules that you set for yourself. Now, there are some really good things about this, right? If you're someone who feels a little bit different to people around you and you always felt not quite the same, then this message that you're free to be you, that's good news. That's liberating. For Christians, having freedom of self-expression, having freedom of religion, is a good thing. To not face punishment for being Christians, that's a great gift from God that we should be thankful for. It's good that we don't live in a totalitarian dictatorship that forces you to conform. If you've read uh, Orwell's 1984, then you would know how horrible that is. Winston Smith the main character in the book, has every moment of his life monitored and regulated by the government. Big Brother dictates the truth. And the moment that anyone questions things shows any sign of individualism, any sign of free thought, any sign of independence, what happens to them? They're dragged off to the ministry of love where they're tortured back into conformity. It's good that our society is nothing like that. That we have great freedom, freedom of personal choice, freedom to be ourselves. But like the teacher in Ecclesiastes says, there's frustration in life under the sun. Our eyes are never full of seeing. Our ears are never full of hearing. We have longings that will never be fully satisfied. And so it's not surprising that there are some real problems with expressive individualism. The first one, and probably the most obvious, is that it's used too often as a license for selfishness. Because ultimately, authenticity is a gospel of self-trust. I'm the boss of me. I'm the most important person. 
you do you or taking some time to get in touch with yourself, following your heart, well, that's just code for I want to be selfish and self-indulgent. I want to ditch my responsibilities. I just want to treat myself. I don't care about you. If authenticity is living according to the rules that I set for myself, then does that sound familiar to you? Anything like maybe the third chapter of the Bible, Genesis? When the people hear God's rules, God's definition of what is good and bad, but decide we don't need God, we can be our own gods. We can decide right and wrong for ourselves. So often authenticity is just code word for selfishness and sin. Secondly, the idea of uh, expressive individualism is, is too idealistic. I don't think it actually works. Have you ever tried turning off every external influence and just listening to your own heart? It's impossible. Our identities, our feelings and our intuitions are entirely shaped by things outside of us. We can't help but be shaped by our families by our friends, by our culture, by our DNA. All of these things play huge roles in shaping who we are. And so it's crazy to suggest you can switch all of that off and just listen to yourself. It's idealistic because, really, human hearts are anxious places. Think about the peak stage of life where you might be an expressive individual, the teenage years. As an as a early teenager, year seven, eight at high school, uh, I had the, we call it a bowl cut now, but it was like the undercut where you shave up the sides and let the sides go down long. And all the surfer kids had it. It was great. I had the wetsuit tan and everything from surfing all weekend. Um, that was who I was in year seven and eight, but I changed my mind in year nine. I discovered a band called Nirvana. I grew my hair long. I stopped hanging out with the surfers and started hanging out with all the grungy kids. And that was who I was. Did you go to a school with Mufti Day? And do you remember that anxiety of Mufti Day? What if I've got the date wrong and I turn up and I'm the only person in my clothes? What do I even wear to Mufti Day anyway? Do I wear like the sensible clothes that mum wants me to wear? Do I wear the clothes that I really like? Maybe, maybe I should turn up in my school uniform just in case. But then what if I'm the only one in my school uniform? Hearts are anxious places, aren't they? Anxious because we are so worried about the crowd and how they'll perceive us. Expressive individualism would say, turn all of that off, ignore it, just be yourself, wear whatever you want to school. I think our hearts are too anxious to try us that seriously. And so we can't help but find our identity, our self-worth, our significance in things outside of us in the people that we really care about, in the groups that we want to belong to, in the hobbies that we have, which leaves us vulnerable because they can let us down. Uh, You all know that I love running, right? If you didn't, I love running. It's, It's my sport. It's my thing. I'm not good at ball sports, but I can run, so that's my thing. It's tempting for me to find my identity in running and to put all the race bibs that I've worn in races over the years on my wall and like, that's me. This is who I am. But the thing about taking my identity from an activity like running is that when life's too hectic for me to make time to run, I start to feel very selfish, like I'm being held back from myself. And so I can get frustrated at all of my responsibilities, like my family, because I don't have enough time for me. And I need to ditch all of that so I can get in touch with myself and go for a big run. But if I get injured and I can't run, then I can start to feel completely helpless. Who am I if I can't do what I love? It's like I'm not myself anymore. So we struggle to find our identity within. Finding our identity in people and groups and things leaves us vulnerable. And authenticity, expressive individualism, also doesn't account for how internally inconsistent we can be, how changeable our thoughts and our feelings are, how anxious and uncertain we can be. Just think back 
to when you were younger on some of the things, the, the thoughts, the values and feelings that you held on to tightly in the past that you've changed your mind on now. If my true self comes from within, then can I ever really know myself if I've changed my mind on things? They change because we have a limited perspective on life. My view of things, and so my ability to listen to my heart, it's limited. It's subjective. And that's the third shortfall of authenticity, that it's limited to me. You know what? It's so easy to misread situations, isn't it? So easy to misinterpret cues that people throw your way. So easy to get things completely wrong. Have you ever texted a friend and they've got really offended and you're like, oh, I didn't mean it like that? Yeah. That's what happens to Elsa in Frozen. She runs away to go and get in touch with herself. And as she's singing about the storm raging on and not caring about the cold, well, everyone she's ever cared about cares about the cold. Arendelle, her people, her, her country, her town is frozen. Her expressive individualism is harmful for other people. And that's the golden rule of, of expressive individualism. Do no harm to others. Be yourself, just don't hurt others. So what does Elsa need? She needs her sister Anna to come and broaden her horizons, to show her that she is harming people. And that with, this is Spider-Man, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> you know, her parents were clumsy in how they trained her, right? But they were right. This power of hers was dangerous. And so she needs to listen to the voices of people around her. Because we have a limited subjective experience, authenticity leaves no room for the possibility that external voices could be good for us. Elsa gets to listen to the voice of her sister, who, spoiler alert, dies for her. It's possible. Did someone just say what? Come on, this has been out for ages. <laughs> it's possible that there is someone who is good for us and we can know that they are good for us because they will lay down our life for us. The good news of the gospel is that we don't have a fictional character. We have someone real, someone who is strong and kind, someone who is good and faithful. And we can know that because he laid down his life for us. It's the Lord Jesus. The God who knows us better than we can ever know ourselves. The God who knows each hair on your head. And the God who, in Christ, tells us who we are. And so rather than searching for true identity within, rather than looking for identity in the crowd, in things that will let us down, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is not the kind of external influence that wants to oppress you. He's not self-interested. He's not harsh like Big Brother. He is gentle. He is strong and kind. He is humble in heart. And he offers rest to all who are weary and burdened. And what is the nature of that rest? And Jesus says, listen to me. Learn from me, as he tells us who we are. It's what Paul is explaining when he writes Colossians 3. That rather than searching for an identity within or in the crowd, we, f we hear our identity from God, from above, as a gift. If you search for your identity within, then if you find it, it's a treasure to hold on to. Hopefully I've suggested that you, you probably won't. Instead, we receive our identity as a gift from God, as he tells us who we are. And what does he say about us? Well, Colossians 3, verse 3. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. If you trust Jesus, then your true self is united to him. 
His death has become your death. His resurrection from the dead has become your resurrection from the dead. His ascension to be seated at the throne in heaven is now yours. Even though we're sitting on seats in a building in barrel, Paul says that we are seated with Jesus in heaven. So who are we? Verse 12, we are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And that means that the Christian life isn't one of anxiety, anxious searching within to find yourself and then perform your feelings to the world. Our identity is not found in things or people or in groups, but it's found in listening to Jesus, listening to who he says we are. And when we hear that, it's not just about ourselves, but it's about him because we're united to him. So it's not just listening, but knowing him, knowing the one who is stable and unchanging, knowing the God who keeps his promises, knowing the God who loves us and sustains us and cares for us. And so it's on that basis that Paul describes what I guess we could call authentic Christianity, living out that self. Verse 5, it's putting to death the things that belong to our old self, the truly destructive things. As Paul writes this list, I wonder if, if you've ever tried looking inside yourself and you've actually found these things rather than something peaceful and harmonious. What's inside you? Uh, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, verse 8, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, verse 9, lies. Have you found those things when you've looked inside? I know I have. Instead, verse 10, we put on the new self that is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. It's belonging to the community of saved people who, verse 11, have no division along racial or economic lines, but live in true diversity and inclusion, which Gav's going to open up for us next week. Verse 12, authentic Christianity looks like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, things that we actually need to work at because they're not natural to us. It's bearing with each other, forgiving each other just as we've been forgiven. And ultimately, verse 14, it's the life of love. Not the self-love, of expressive individualism, but the self-giving love that Jesus has shown us on the cross. Isn't that so much more wonderful than trying to figure yourself out? Here's the thing, though. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you'll know that all of this doesn't make you immune to anxiety and despair and insecurity. We have a new identity from Jesus, and it's true of us now, but we're also not there yet. We still need to be putting to death the old self and clothing ourselves with Christ. We live in a time of tension between who we were and who we will be. God declares that we're chosen and holy and dearly loved, that we're forgiven, but we still wrestle with temptation and sin, don't we? We still forget to listen to him. We drown out his voice and listen to our own or all the other voices in the world. We have the promise of God and we await its fulfillment. Expressive individualism doesn't say anything about the future. It has no message of hope for your future because it's oriented to now. Live in the moment. Be present in the now. The future doesn't matter. The past doesn't matter. What matters is right now. Christianity is oriented to the future and living today in light of that future. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's our future. And so today, we go about living authentic Christian lives, listening to him and looking forward to that day. When he appears, when our earthly nature, which is distorted and marred and broken by sin, will be gone and will be clothed with our glorious resurrected bodies. When we'll experience and live in that true self, that true identity that is now hidden with Christ in God and will be revealed on the day that he returns. That's Christian hope. 
Not fingers crossed hope, but hope that is grounded in Jesus' own resurrection from the dead. And so if you want to live a truly authentic life, if authenticity is what you crave, then stop the anxious quest. Stop looking within. Stop worrying about the crowd. And listen to your creator. Learn from him. He is humble. He is gentle. He is strong and kind. And you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know us completely. You know us even better than we know ourselves. And yet in Christ, you've forgiven us. You've adopted us into your household and made us your dearly loved children. And so, Father, help us in the midst of this anxious world to listen to Jesus, to know who we are in him, and to live confident Christian lives, putting off our old earthly nature and putting on our new selves, being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of you, our creator. Amen.